recording. Thank you. So welcome to How to Research Your Historic Property. My name is Matthew Pierce. I'm the National Register of Historic Places Coordinator at the Oklahoma, at the Oklahoma State Historic Preservation Office. Uh, we are a division within the Oklahoma Historical Society. Our office is located in the Oklahoma History Center in Oklahoma City. Uh, judging from the responses, for those of you who responded to the poll questions, um, seemed like most of you are um, either familiar with the research process, but want to take a deeper dive, or it's an everyday part of your job, and a couple of you are all are just looking for refreshers, which I'm always happy to see. Uh, those of you who responded to the polls regarding who you're affiliated with, um, a couple of people have, play, have, have put other. Um, Seems like most of the people here are associated with uh, a nonprofit organization, which is great, and a couple people with uh, state agencies or offices. So always great to, to have everybody. It's kind of a, always a good kind of diverse range of, of backgrounds and, and people who are interested in this in this topic. So um, if you need a certificate, please provide your name and agency affiliation in the chat. Um, and again, as I mentioned at the start of the webcast, you're more than welcome to provide questions or comments in the chat or in the Q&A function. I do have several breaks set aside within the presentation uh, for me to address any questions that you have. So as the questions come to you, don't hesitate to put them in, in the chat or the Q&A. That doesn't bug me at all. Just you know that get them in there, and then I will address them as I can uh, in, in the presentation. So um, with that, Let's uh, get started. This presentation should last um, around an hour and a half, uh, maybe maybe shorter, depending on uh, the amount of questions that we have. And I will say this is geared. Uh, this is an introductory webinar. Uh, this is for this is aimed towards to individuals who 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 don't have a whole lot of experience with uh, historic research, or they're just getting started with preparing uh, National Register nominations and so with that in mind uh you know this is kind of just a basic walkthrough it's geared specifically towards uh towards buildings uh if you were in the webinar yesterday on the national register uh, of course you learned there are different resource types that can be listed on, under the national register buildings structures objects uh sites and, and districts um you know, for the purposes of, of this, you know, I'm, I'm trying to just kind of walk you through how to research and do the preparation for a National Register nomination. And when, when I was thinking about it, kind of the easiest way to do that was with a freestanding building. So so that's kind of the, the template that we're gonna, gonna look at here um, based on some of responses from yesterday's poll questions about future topics. I do think we will, we will be crafting some presentations in the future about um, how to research, how to conduct research for an archaeological site um, or for a cemetery and something like and, and things on those lines. So some of the more unique property types that we that we come across. So so keep uh, pay attention to to those. We'll get those uh, created here within you know here the in the next year. So with that, let's think about uh, organization. There's three basically. There's three things to keep in mind when you're approaching uh, your research for a historic topic. The first thing is, or researching your historic property, the first thing is organization. Decide what you need to know and where you can find it. Make a list of questions uh, that you want to answer. You can make a list of specific tasks, note, noting where you need to go, uh, to whom you need to speak, and what you expect to find, and in the order in which you intend to proceed. Um, Oftentimes, especially when I'm working with with individuals who, you know, maybe they they own a historic property, they're they're wanting to take on the nomination process themselves. Uh, they don't want to necessarily worry about hiring a hiring a consultant. It's that organization um, category where um, whether you know if the if the preparer is well organized and and disciplined, then the nomination research can can take off and it can essentially kind of take care of itself. But if the person is unorganized, scattered, um, you know, then it, it becomes a bit more difficult. So in terms of organization, know what you need to find and where you can find it. Uh, the second part is identification. Identify what historic information is readily available. And the key word there is readily. Um, I'm not expecting folks to go to the National Archives 
to do research for these uh, for, for for most of our historic properties in Oklahoma. Um, so identify what information is readily available. Think about um, what materials maybe the the property owner has access to, um, or what accesses what uh, resources are available in your local community, whether it's the local uh, local town or, or county government. Um, local library, things like that. And then the last thing is research facilities, you know, contacting those organizations and institutions that may hold source materials in um, advance. Um, and that's especially like so, like if you're wanting to come visit the Oklahoma History Center, uh, for instance, or if you're wanting to go visit a special collections at, say, the University of Oklahoma or Oklahoma State University or, or another local um, college or university, um, contact those organizations in advance and do everything you can to notify them exactly what you're looking to accomplish. Um, you know, know the know the hours, um, and be aware of of any um, health and safety protocols that may be in place. Um, uh, due to uh, and due to COVID, um, a number of research fa research facilities have started to um, request uh, people to um, uh, submit appointments in order to research uh, collections at their facilities. Um, also, one thing to keep in mind, like if you are wanting to access like, you know, primary source materials like manuscripts, diaries, things like that, some of those things are stored away. Sometimes they may be stored off site. Those facilities are going to need time to get that material available for you to look at. So keep those things in mind as you start this process. So again, as mentioned on the onset, at the outset, this is, you know, geared mainly as an introductory process. And, framed around a freestanding building. So this is the uh, McLean home. It's located in Oklahoma City in Oklahoma County. It was built in 1911. It's set on roughly a two acre property um, just north uh, northwest of the Oklahoma State Capitol complex. It was used as a family residence for almost 80 years. And it was listed in the National Register in November 2020 at the local level of significance under Criterion C. Remember that the property itself is a primary source of information. And let's look a little bit more detail about what exactly that means. So that means documents such as the abstract of title, um, any architectural or construction drawings, maybe that are that were that are that are, that were issued, uh, may be housed by a local architecture foundation, or they may be housed by a permit office. Um, looking at architectural journals, building permits cemetery records, census records, uh, church records. So in a little bit more detail, the abstract, for instance, tells you the deeds, mortgages, names of owners, when the property may have changed hands, legal boundaries, things like that. Um, especially if you're working on a freestanding building, um, if you have access to the abstract of title, that thing is worth its weight in gold because that can tell you everything that you need to know and you're not necessarily having to go to the county clerk's office and trying to track down all that information individually it should all be kind of cataloged for you uh, drawings you know so i have a photo of a, of a floor plan there on the lower left those can tell you the architect or the builder they can tell you the original design plan um, for the building it can give you the built date also of of consequence it can give you the date of any um, alterations uh any or any proposed um, changes that may have happened as as construction um, unfolded so uh, drawings are a very valuable resource you don't necessarily have to have them but they are pretty valuable especially if you're making the case for a property's significance for architecture um, Architectural journals, you know, they can give you biographies of certain architects. They, again, they can reprint um, architectural drawings or, or photographs of, of, of buildings that are under construction or have just been completed. Uh, building permits can also kind of tell you, you know, things like who the architect was, the, the client, the, the contractor. Um, notable, you know, interesting information about the, the cost of construction work or the date that work commenced. Um, the last three things, cemetery records, census, and, and church records, um, those can give you uh, an, an idea into uh, family relationships, uh, dates of, of birth and, and death. Uh, in terms of the census, you know, depending on the types of census that it is, it can give you a sense of property ownership, acreage, crops that were maybe grown on a property, uh, the ethnic background of residents at a property, um, and church records can give you things like, again, birth, death, 
um, maybe the date of, of, of baptism, dates of marriage, things like that. So the kind of the good, the, the personal information about maybe who lived there and when. Uh, other sources of information, uh, commercial histories, uh, you know, histories of local industries and businesses. So if you uh, are researching a, a, a notable commercial building in a downtown, if you can find a, a commercial history of, of that business or of that, um, of that local community, that can be helpful. That goes to the next point, community, county, and, and state histories. Um, those, uh, those publications can give you fairly detailed information about um, certain structures, certain people, um, certain events that um, you know you, you may not find in a in a in an Oklahoma history textbook. But if you are finding you know if you're looking at a specific county history or a specific community history, you may find um, information about those specific events or um, you know little biographical sketch, sketches about certain individuals. Corporate and business records. Um, you know those can give you things like the nature and source of items sold, economic uh, or the economic um, you know, the economic activities of, of certain businesses, um, you know, things that could count under that category. Uh, think like you're researching a, um, you know, a, a commercial, uh, commercial, a, a store um, or, a, or a trading post or something like that. Um, you may, you know, you know, you may try to find those, um, those logs, you know, something like that. Uh, court documents, civil and criminal court actions, divorces, property suits, um, probate records, you know, those types of, you know, those types of documents can be helpful. Deeds, you know, that's kind of ties back to say like the abstract of title that can give you information about ownership, property value, um, anything like that. Directories um, or gazetteers, directories can be very valuable, especially if you're looking at a, at a property that's within an, an urban or suburban setting. Uh, that can give you um, the occupants of dwellings, merchants, advertisements um, that can give you a, a wealth of information oftentimes in combination with the property abstract or um, deeds research that type of thing and then the last two things estate records and, and family papers um, again that can give you a sense of, of property changes ownership changes um, you know family papers may have things like photographs um, architectural plans or again history uh, anything that's related to the history of that property or certain events that took place at that property so I'm giving you some detailed information on the different sources of information um, one thing I will mention is that I would not expect um, a nomination to to go into each of these sources of information um, you have to kind of select which sources of information work best for the property type that you're working for so if you're looking at um, a residential property, then yeah, things like family papers, deeds, um, you know, those types of resources are going to take um, precedence over uh, commercial history because it's a residence. But if you're looking at uh, more of a commercial property, um, then, you know, a commercial history may make more sense or, you know, a community history that provides a, uh, a detailed discussion of the contributions that that business made to the community. Those things would be would, would would take precedence. Some of these may be a bit uh, repetitive, but additional sources: uh, genealogical records, biograph, you know, biographies of individuals, family histories, photographs, um, homestead records. If you're looking at a uh, more rural property, um, you know, homestead, you know, those types of land patents are available through uh, the Bureau of Land Management, um, and again, those can kind of give you some indication on. Maybe the buildings and structures that are located on the homestead, uh, the marital status of, of individuals, any children they had, their ages, their origins, you know, those types of things. Um, insurance records uh, can give you things like the floor plan, uh, dates of construction, um, oral histories, you know, anything that may provide uh, personal recollections about a property, um, land records, again, kind of related to, to homestead records to a certain extent, any information uh, concerning uh, that might be uh, associated with the general land office, um, homestead patents, uh, mining districts, any patent claims, um, maps and plats, uh, such as the plat that I have pictured here, um, military records, you know, pension records, addresses, you know, status and personal effects. Newspapers are a very common resource, um, kind of alongside with oral histories and genealogical records that we often see. Um, you know, newspapers can include anything from the lines of advertisements, um, you know, local gossip in the society pages, obituaries, um, newspapers provide 
uh, especially you know newspapers that are associated with the early development of of towns and cities they have a lot of information on local building efforts you know such and such has started building you know has started construction on on this building those types of things and also you know announcements you know related to 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 the social development of the community you know birth dates um, uh, weddings those types of things and then lastly uh, tax records um, you know those things can give you a sense of the relative value of property um, its association with a certain individual um, the integrity of the property those types of things overall in terms of applying this to a national register nomination you know the, the kind of purpose of these first few slides is to give you a sense of the variety of sources of information that are out there and then depending on the property type using that combination of of sources that work best for you in order to establish um, a national register criteria under which the property can be listed, its period of significance, and an assessment of its historic property. So for instance, the above plat, or I guess the plat that I have pictured here, was used to establish, to help establish the integrity of location and setting for the McLean home, the house that I had pictured earlier. Uh, Barrow's second edition to Oklahoma City was platted in 1902. Uh, the McLean home is located in block 21, which is outlined in red at the corner of what was originally 25th Street and Nebraska Avenue, now Walnut Avenue. So just having that plat available, you know, along with the legal description, you know, helped establish the, you know, the, the, lo the lo especially the location of the historic property. Spend a moment to talk about photographs. Um, or postcards. These can give you a sense of the architecture of, of a building, any landscape features, um, any alterations, um, or any associated structures on a property. In short, historic photographs give you a sense of how the built environment has changed over time. Uh, and this is something, um, you know, I'm a historian by training, you know, coming up through grad school and the like, I was focused I lived mainly in the archives. I've may, I worked mainly with written documents or oral histories. Didn't pay much attention to, to historic photographs until I got more into the architecture side of things and historic preservation where I'm at now. And photographs can tell you a lot about the built environment and how buildings are designed, how they change over time, and how the setting around them changes over time. It's at this point in the presentation that I would tout the Gateway to Oklahoma History database. Um, which I could actually include in the chat real quick. Gateway. Let me just double check it real quick. Gateway. Yeah. Hang on a sec. Gateway. Yeah. There's the link. Um, the Gateway is a is a wonderful uh, resource because we have a lot of historic photographs that have since been digitized. Um, the above photographs, for instance. Are of Whittier School in Oklahoma City, which was listed in 2021 um, at the local level of significance under Criterion A for education and under Criterion C for architecture. Uh, the photograph in the upper right hand corner was taken in 1910, um, just before the building opened to students. The photograph in the bottom right was taken in 1957 when the school was about to close. And those two photographs uh, kind of provide a nice bookend. Uh, through which we can assess uh, historic integrity of the building. So for instance, the 1910 photograph shows the, the building in its original design. In the bottom right, you can see there's been a couple of additions, you know, one addition added to essentially each end of the building. You know, those additions are clearly visible. You note certain changes or, uh, or, or you know, slight alterations, um, you know, but you also know things, you know, the, the key aspects of integrity that the building has maintained through its um, historic use as a school, you know, the brick exterior, the cast stone ornamentation. Um, one thing of note is, uh, you know, the, the metal paneling that's visible in the 1910 photograph uh, between the second and third story windows. You can tell that by 1957, um, you know, that material had been covered over. Um, but overall, you know, the photographs show that the building was clearly, you know, clearly maintained um, historic uh, integrity. So photographs are a valuable resource to have if, if of course, you can find them for, um, for historic properties. Maps. 
are another valuable um, resource. And this can be any number of maps, town maps, property plats, uh, land ownership maps, um, highway maps, um, you know, any any type any type of, of map can be pretty pretty valuable because it can give you a sense of, of location, boundaries, uses, um, and also maybe even the presence, especially if you're looking at a more rural property, uh, any, you know, the presence of any you know adjacent or nearby outbuildings or or structures or those types of things. Um, the above map. Uh, was produced by the by the General Land Office. It's of Choctaw County, sections um, four through six uh, in Township 7 South, range 18 east of the Indian Meridian. Um, similar to um, historic photographs, a lot of historic maps are available um, dig uh, digitally. Uh, and depending on the database that you're using, you may be able to search for historic maps by by town, uh, by uh, latitude, longitude coordinates. Um, so they've they've gotten they've gotten very easy uh, to utilize. Uh, a couple of er a few areas where you can find uh, maps. You might start first with like your county clerk or city or county archives. They may have um, maps like maybe bound collections of maps that may not be available elsewhere. Um, a number of special collections. Uh, have been are useful. Um, one thing, one that I mentioned here is um, Oklahoma State University has several special collections dedicated to uh, digital maps, digital mapping projects. Um, they also have an aerial photograph database, which I'll mention mention later. Uh, the General Land Office has uh, several um, digital um, map databases available. Um, one that I use frequently is called TopoView, um, and there's also various um, Websites out there that are, that are prepared by a number of different vendors, such as um, oldmapsonline.org. Maps that are of particular importance for the built environment are fire insurance maps, namely Sanborn fire insurance maps and uh, Clarkson fire insurance maps. Uh, these maps were a product created to help fire insurance companies assess potential risks involved with underwriting policies. As such, they provide detailed information regarding towns and building construction. Uh, Sanborn maps, uh, which I have a segment in the in the bottom right of the slide, they're they're much better. They're they're well known. They're available through uh, the Library of Congress. Um, if uh, if you uh, are, live within central Oklahoma or within the Oklahoma, in, in Oklahoma County in particular, uh, the Metropolitan Library System also has um, a digital database. Uh, you might, if you're not in Oklahoma County, you might check with your local libraries and see if they have subscriptions to that database um, as well. Um, now, of course, Sanborns and Clarksons were um, a service that cities paid for. So coverage can be spotty. So you're not, it's rare, for, you're not going to find Sanborns, you know, year after year for these for these communities, you might have a Sanborn for the town in 1907, and then maybe there's a jump, and the city didn't um, didn't pay for the the Sanborn company to come back in until 1922, and then maybe not again until 1949 or something like that. So, there, you know, coverage can be can be spotty, and there are some parts of of towns and cities that were overlooked. Um, because of, in, in part, because in some cases, you know, town, you know, sections of the city that may not have been, they may have been developing, but they may not have been included within city limits yet. Um, those parts may not be covered in uh, in a Sanborn map. So just keep those things in in mind. Overall, Sanborn maps were published between um, 1867 and 1970. Uh, the Clarkson maps, uh, such as the map that's in the upper left, uh, they were more short-lived but they did provide coverage for smaller towns and cities. And so overall Clarkson maps in Oklahoma date generally from 1892 uh, to 1931. And the Gateway to Oklahoma history does have a digitized collection of Clarkson maps. So um, oftentimes when I'm doing research, I look at those, you know, I look at Clarkson's and Sanborn's um, interchangeably if, if I can. Um, if not, I'm having to rely on, on one or, or the other. You'll notice by looking at the photographs that, you know, these maps have certain symbols, the buildings have certain colors and those types of things. Um, with that in mind, you know, remember that 
these maps were created for a very specific use. And so although now these maps are valuable for a variety of purposes, the fire insurance industry dictated the selection of information to be mapped and the way that information was portrayed. And so each of these maps for each edition on the first page, they provided a key for what each of these colors and symbols mean. And so knowledge of those keys and the color coding is essential to proper interpretation of the information. So if we look at the lower right, for instance, um, this is a property that's located, um, you know, you see the, the street address is 1515. Um, the number in the upper right hand corner of that building, the two that indicates that for the most part, this is a two story building. We have a one story front porch and a one story back porch. The D indicates that, indicates that this is a dwelling. Uh, the A that's in the lower right hand corner of that, of that building indicates that we have an attached garage or auto house. And the, um, the yellow color indicates that this building is of frame construction, wood frame construction. Uh, the pink color that's around the, the auto house indicates that it's, um, that the first story is, is essentially constructed of fireproof tile, which again kind of indicates because it was a garage, it needed to have some sort of fireproof material between it and the rest of, and the rest of the house. And the other thing of note is in, you know, in lot 19 behind the house, there's a two story, um, auto house or garage that's also constructed of fireproof. Um, tile. So those are some of the things, you know, the keys have all of that information. Um, and so, but they are a very valuable resource. And if you use Sanborns enough, you get to the point where, you know, it becomes a kind of a second language and you kind of know what, um, you know, what those symbols mean. Aerial photographs. Um, there's a wealth of aerial photography available through a variety of sources and aerial photos can do a couple of things. One, they can fill in the gaps that aren't covered by Sandmore maps. Uh, this, this was really handy for me when I was doing research on the McLean home because the McLean home was originally outside of Oklahoma City's city limits. And so it was not documented in any of the editions of the Sandmore maps. And so aerial photographs were really all I had to work with in terms of trying to get a sense of um, and, you know, any changes that happen to the property and into the setting over time. And, you know, in addition to the McLean house, if you think about it, and I mentioned this in yesterday's presentation, um, more and more properties that date to the mid to late 20th century um, are becoming um, eligible or, you know, they're, you know, coming under consideration for potential National Register eligibility, and those properties just flat out aren't documented in the Sanborns or with the Sanborns document is maybe the first or second generation of development on that property, and, but they don't cover, but they won't document the, the building in question. And so, um, so for instance, if we have a couple of nominations um, upcoming where um, you know, like in one case, the, the building replaced um, a school building and the school building, of course, is documented on the Sanborn, but then that school was demolished to uh, accommodate construction of the new building, which isn't, um, you know, documented by the Sanborns. And so aerial photos can provide another way to, to look at things like setting and, and things like that. The other key thing that aerial photos provide is a sense of change over time. So again, it allows you a, an opportunity to assess um, aspects of integrity, um, especially location and setting, um, also to a certain extent, feeling and association. Um, one thing that I will note is a number of consultants who prepare nominations. I was one of those for a number of years. Um, you know, oftentimes within the nominations, um, consultants will include, you know, copies of basically relevant aerial photographs to provide reviewers with a sense of how the integrity of location and setting may have changed over time. And so for instance, of the McLean home, for instance, um, you have a couple of photographs here. Um, I believe the one in the upper left was a 1937 aerial photograph and the, the location of the home is outlined in red. You can see the home is clearly visible. You can see the, the prominent, you know, square footprint of the home. Um, you can tell that the, you know, rest of the property is largely undeveloped, may have been used for cultivation. Uh, and you kind of get a sense of, you know, the 
immediate setting is also predominantly rural. Uh, photograph in the lower right. I think this was taken, I think, in either the late 1930s or this may have been the early 1940s. Uh, you can see several oil derricks available, you know, or several oil der derricks that are visible. You can see the state capitol in the foreground, and you can kind of get a sense of, of course, in the nomination, I was able to zoom in a bit more on the on the on the building itself. You can get a, you know, if you zoomed in on the on the house, you'd be able to at least get a sense of the key exterior features, such as the porch, the roof line, those types of things. So, with that, any questions? about the various sources of information or photographs, uh, maps, any anything at all, feel free to, to enter those into the, the chat or the Q&A. If not, we will forge ahead. So we've talked about the various sources of information that are available to you in preparing a nomination. And I think one thing uh, that you can take away is the amount of information that is increasingly available to you on your desktop uh, through, you know, digital photographs, digital maps, um, you know, Many census records, city directories are available digitally through databases like Ancestry.com, um, those types of things. You know, someone like me, I still love being able to go to the library or, you know, you know, and do some of that research. But there's a wealth of material out there available to you, you know, if you're interested in researching a historic property and preparing a nomination. So that's the next step here. You've done your research. And now you get into, okay, you're preparing a national register form. Can you answer the following questions? You know, foremost, how many buildings, structures, and other resources make up the property? So we talked yesterday about the different types of resources that are eligible for national register consideration, building structures, sites, and so on. And so when you're looking at your property, how many of those resources are, um, are present? Um, when was the property constructed? When did it attain its current form? What are the property's historic characteristics? And what changes have been made over time and when? And have those changes affected the property's historic integrity? So for the McLean home pictured here, there is one building on the property. There were no other structures or objects on the property at this point. Um, the property was built in the building. The house was built in 1911. Um, historic characteristics. Uh, notable characteristics include the blonde brick exterior with corner coins and the wraparound porch with the wood railing. Uh, you notice the, the dormer retains historic windows. Uh, the interior, not pictured here, unfortunately, um, also retained its original layout and many historic features and finishes that included wood floors, um, wood casing, um, pocket doors, you know, things of that, things of that nature. There were really no significant modifications or alterations. Um, the vinyl siding that you see over the eaves and soffits was installed at an unknown date. Um, however, the historic materials remained underneath. As you can, as you can see, there's still remnants of know the historic um, beadboard soffits for instance and so of course they're in poor condition but they're there um, so those are you know those are kind of the key takeaways for this for this particular building based in response to those questions other questions what is the current condition of the property and that includes the exterior the grounds the setting and the interior how is the property used during this period of significance and how is it used today that addresses specifically integrity of uh, integrity of association who occupied or used the property historically did they individually make any import, important contributions to history who is the current owner you know those tough questions address um, you know the, you know potentially say like criterion B, for instance, is the property associated with a significant person, even if it's not associated with a significant person who lived there and you know how long did they live there? Um, what was the property called at the time it was associated with 
important events or persons or took on its important physical character that gave it its importance. So in other words, what's its historic name? Um, so again, the McLean home, I think is a good example. Yesterday I talked a bit about, you know, the, the balance between condition versus integrity. Uh, the house itself was in fair to poor condition at the time of the nomination. You can see the porch itself was becoming structurally unsound. Um, however, the building retained high degrees of integrity, especially of setting. Uh, it was still able to convey the feeling of a rural house that was originally set on the outskirts of Oklahoma City. Um, it was a single family owner uh, and the property certainly um, benefited from that. It had been vacant for a few years prior to uh, the nomination and the nomination was written on behalf of, of a new property owner that is planning to rehabilitate the property and that rehabilitation is, is currently ongoing. Um, it was essentially a single family who bought and owned the property. Uh, the McLean family uh, inhabitants included John, his wife Nellie, and daughters Isla and Francis. Uh, most notably, Isla and Francis, along with Francis's husband and their three sons, resided in the house for over 50 years. And even more questions. So, was the property associated with important events, activities, or persons? How does the property relate to the history of the community where it is located? And how does the property illustrate any themes or trends important to the history of its community, state, or nation? So say like that last question gets at what we were talking about yesterday about the different levels of significance. Is this a locally significant property or is it a nationally significant property? So in the case of the McLean home, it, it was listed for its architectural significance, specifically as an outstanding local example of Prairie School architecture in what was originally the rural outskirts of Oklahoma City. It's listed at the local level of significance. Very few houses, if any, in this section of Oklahoma City date to this period and have retained such high degrees of integrity. Uh, really the only comparable, comparable example that I could find when preparing the nomination for a house in this part of the city built you know, around this time was the Horn Homestead, uh, which is a very notable Queen Anne style um, uh, residence um, south, of, south of this building, south of the Oklahoma State Capitol. Um, overall, the property illustrates the early rural history of Northeast Oklahoma City, and it's unique in an area otherwise characterized by commercial warehouses and offices. It was even potentially an endangered property given the, encro the encroachment of the State Capitol complex. And if you're interested in learning more uh, about this property, um, I have attached the nomination. If you click on the handouts tab, you'll see I have several handouts available, including some handouts that provide some just basic assistance on historic home research or historic property research. And you should also see a link to the McLean home nomination. Um, so if you're, you know, that can give you a good sense of, you know, how to go about preparing a nomination, especially for, for a freestanding um, building such as this. In addition to, say, that nomination or the handouts that we have provided, um, our office is regularly providing um, virtual learning programs. Um, we're just about to finish up, I think, our last presentations later this month. We've had a, a year-long series on barns in Oklahoma. Um, and then we've also recently started a series called Lunch and Learns, uh, where we've, we're you know, we're talking about a, a wide range of subjects related to historic preservation. And one thing about the lunch and learns and also the, the Barnes um, presentations, you know, oftentimes we're, we're working to bring in experts in those respected fields to, 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 to talk about those topics. And best of all, these programs are free and they're recorded. And so if you can't make it, you can always, you know, uh, you know look, up, look up those presentations elsewhere. Okay, I'm not seeing any questions or, or comments um, so far. Feel free to add those um, as we go along. Um, one key part of you know the nomination form is uh, it's it provides photographic documentation of of the property you know, as it is currently. Um, so these nominations provide a really good snapshot of, really a snapshot in time of how these properties um, 
you know, of these properties. And so there's um, a photographic component to this, um, as well as, you know, the research and writing component. And, you know, there are some, uh, I know we have a few consultants in the, in the audience. Um, there are some consultants that, that firms that they actually have their own um, professional photographers who go out and take their photographs um, for them. I know we also have folks with state agencies who they're the ones that are out in the field actually taking the photographs themselves. Um, that was something that I um, certainly had to learn as well when I was in the, on, you know, being a consultant was, you know, I was the one who, you know, took the photographs. So I had to learn kind of how to, how to, you know, learn the best practices for, for taking photographs. So um, here's, you know, here, the following are a few tips to, to keep in mind for photographs. The key takeaway from this is that anybody should be able to take the photographs necessary to, to submit with a national register nomination. There's just a few kind of basic guidelines to cover, um, basically depending on the resource type. So if you're looking at buildings, um, structures, or objects, um, we really need one or more views showing the facade or the primary elevation. Um, any additions or alterations should show in the photograph. Don't, don't crop the photograph. Don't frame your photograph in a way that cut those additions or alterations out. Um, we need to see we need to see the building or the structure in its entirety. Um, also include photographs of the interior, outbuildings, etc. if significance is dependent upon them. Um, one thing to th keep, keep in mind like for a building, if you're making the argument that the building is significant for architecture, so it's under criterion C, more often than not we are going to expect photographs of the interior or if for some reason you can't access the interior, um, please indicate that in the nomination form. So um, overall, the number of photographs that you need to submit uh, depends on the size and complexity of the property. Submit as many photographs as needed to depict the current condition and significant aspects of the property. Earlier in the presentation, we talked about historic photographs. Um, you can include prints of historic photographs to supplement the documentation. Um, and that can come in really handy if you're, if you're talking about um, maybe there was a, a certain alteration that happened between the historic period and when the nomination is prepared. Say like maybe the building had a tile, um, had an awning that was clad in tile. And then at some point that awning was removed and replaced with a different type of type of awning. Um, you know, having a historic photograph that shows, you know, the awning as it originally appeared could be helpful. So keep that in mind. You can include current photographs. You can always include historic photographs to supplement um, that documentation. So, for instance, here is um, this was a photograph from yesterday. This is the old Santa Fe Railroad Bridge uh, near Juanette. So note how, you know, the photographer is standing on know, one bank and looking at the bridge in its entirety. Uh, so you can kind of get a sense of the scale of the structure. And then, of course, there's other photographs in the nomination that may provide uh, a more detailed close up of one of the trusses, you know, or, you know, things like that. But including at least a few photographs that provide a sense uh, of the structure or the building in its location, in its setting are really crucial. Here's one of, of Whittier School. So we had the historic photographs um, earlier. Um, you know, you notice like this is a photograph that I took. This is a photograph kind of taken near the same location of the historic 1910 photograph. And it shows the building as it is um, today. Um, you notice the street in the foreground. I think if I recall, like this street had a had a median uh, in between the different lanes of traffic. So I literally just went, you know, walked out to the median, you know, turned around and, and snapped snap the photograph. As I mentioned earlier, include interiors if, 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 um, if significance is dependent upon them. That's namely for um, criterion C. Not always. Um, I, you know, we have um, you know, a person in the audience today who's interested in um, a Masonic Lodge. Um, you know, for, uh, for that type of building, um, I would be interested to see uh, the interior of the former lodge space you know is it still intact does it still have its historic features and finishes um, because that's you know where the building you know partially attained its social significance so we need to see if that interior is still intact um, photograph of the left this is of the mclean home so you can kind of get a sense of the the integrity of 
design materials and workmanship that I've that I mentioned earlier on the interior. Um, you see the wood casework, you see the wood floors, um, the staircase. Um, you can get you know there's the pocket door to the right. Uh, the right photograph is of the Schultz Neal Stone Barn in Noble County. Um, the, again, listed for uh, under Criterion C for architecture. You know, note the wood trusses um, and that type of thing. So, um, you know, include interior photographs if significance is dependent upon them. Now, for historic and archaeological sites, the approach is similar but but somewhat different. Um, you need to include one or more views depicting the site condition. Um, if relevant, you can include photographs of, art of artifacts recovered from the site. So if there have been excavations that were, that were done, you can include photographs of artifacts. And you need to include at least one photograph that shows uh, the context, that shows the environment. So here are a few photographs of uh, Rose Hill Plantation in Choctaw County. Um, this was a site that was under active um, excavate, uh, you know, archaeological investigation when the nomination was prepared, and so you know, photographs show that um, show that work taking place. They show the artifacts um, that were uncovered, um, you know, those types of things. So, so keep those in mind. And for historic districts. Um, you know, those are districts, if you recall, those include multiple resources, you know, multiple buildings or multiple, you know, any combination of buildings, structures, and objects. And so photographs need to provide a representation of major buildings and styles. Streetscapes, landscapes, and aerials are recommended. And then one thing is to recall is you should include a key that includes the location of all those photographs you know, on a map. And that's true for both districts and for individual buildings or structures as well. Like to provide a, a photo key that provides just a basic understanding of the location where each of these photographs were taken. And I have an example of, of what that key looks like later in the presentation. With districts, it's the same as taking photographs of an individual building or an individual structure. Um, the number of photographs that you need depends on the size and complexity of the property. So, if it's a relatively small historic district or a relatively compact historic district, you may not need to include as many photos. Um, whereas if you're documenting a residential historic district that may include, say, two or 300 resources, you know, you'll know you need to be providing um, a representative number of photographs that provide us with a, a sense of the historic character of the district. So we have, um, we have several district nominations that include a couple of hundred pho photographs. So, and we also have nominations for historic districts that maybe include 10 or 11 because the district maybe encompasses a couple of lots or it's more compact. So keep those things in mind. In terms of photographs for, for districts, um, you know, you know, here it's a, you know, you get a good sense of the buildings that are located along the block. You've got a sense of, the, you've got the street and the foreground. So you have you know, idea of how these buildings essentially fit, you know, what the setback is. You've got a view of downtown Tulsa in the background, so you kind of get a sense of both location and, and setting, feeling and association, um, all those things. Um, obviously, the more complex that a historic property is, the more photographs um, that will be needed. A um, couple things to keep in mind trying to save time and space by shooting a minimum number of views to document a property is false economy. Too many photographs is inexpensive relative to the time, personnel, and equipment. It is far more expensive to go back to a site to shoot more photos than it is to have more than you have, the head, or excuse me, than it is to have more than you need when you leave. So in other words, when you're on site, take as many photos as you can. You can, that's the beauty of digital technology. You can, take as many as you need, you can always sort through them later. Photographs for district nominations need to include non-contributing buildings and not or non-contributing resources and contributing resources. So similar to uh, if you're taking photographs of a building, how I mentioned earlier, you need to you need to take photographs of additions and alterations. For districts, you need to include both contributing and non-contributing resources. 
in, in your photography. So this is of the 100 block in of North, of North Greenwood Avenue in Tulsa. So the One Oak Field building that you see there to the right, that's a, that's a non-contributing resource to the district. All the buildings to the left are contributing and so it's a good photograph to take because you show it shows the non-contributing resource in relation to the nearby non-contributing resources it shows all of those resources in relation to each other this is a photograph of the founders place historic district in muskogee um, again it's a good general district nomination photograph it provides a good representation of the features and styles of those resources that contribute to the district's significance. So again, we get a good sense of, you know, how these buildings are in relation to each other, the various styles, the various features, the, their setbacks, um, all of those things. The nomination form includes a, a section for a photo log, or essentially like just the essentially charts the number of photographs that you took you know the subject of those photographs and then the direction that the camera is facing and so here's a couple of examples um, of some photographs of, of some photo logs this is at the end of the nomination form um, and and so same thing like each each photograph that's included in the nomination you should number those photographs um, indicate the the subject uh, or basically a brief description of what that photograph shows and the direction that the camera is facing. And then the photo log, as you can also see, includes um, information including the name of the property, the photographer, and the date that the, um, the date that the property was photographed. So those are a couple of examples of, of photo logs. Again, I have uh, you know the example from the McLean home nomination. If you scroll down towards the end of that nomination, you'll see uh, where that photo log is located. And I also mentioned earlier a photo key. And so um, Basically, a photo key is you're, you're keying the location of all those photographs on a site match and on a site map, excuse me. And the photo numbers must cor must must match um, to the corresponding photo from the photo log. And so, for instance, on the left here, this is the photo key for the McLean home. Um, photograph number one, which you see towards the bottom of, of the page, you know, that arrow is pointing north, indicating the location, the direction the camera is facing. If you go back to if we go back to the previous slide, photograph number one, general building view, Northeast 26th Street and foreground, direction of the camera's facing is north. That's that photograph there. Photograph two is there, three, four, five, and so on. In terms of what the site map needs to look like, um, more often than not, all we need is is an image, you know, is a kind of copy of an aerial image. Um, you know, not everyone has access to um, architectural software. Um, for the Whittier School nomination, this was, uh, you know, this was in my previous life as a as a consultant with an architectural with an architecture firm. You know, so you know, I had someone in our office just draw a basic site map, and so you know, that's something that can, you know, if you have access to that type of software or someone with that expertise, you know, feel free have them do it. Um, you know, but if you're doing this on your own. You don't have that type of software um, a site map you know a, a, a you know an aerial overlay is basically all we need and basically to include it just kind of a the key should indicate the the rough location of where each of the photographs were taken because in that way if someone ever was wanting to redocument the site you know if they could stand at that same location they should be able to see uh, the same thing and if you don't have any expertise with this type of type of work and you're you're doing this type of you know this work on your own you know let me know and i'm happy to help you with the process so in terms of improving um, photographs the key thing to take away from here is use common sense um, your goal and this is, and I would say this for, if you're documenting a property for a national register nomination, or if you're out there doing, you know, you're with a state agency or a consultant firm, and you're doing some type of, of cultural resources work, you're doing survey work. I mean, your goal should be to, you know, portray, um, you know, it should be to best portray the district, the, the building, you know, the site, what have you. 
um, you know, portray it in its in, as as best you can. And so, in order to get the best possible image, um, extraneous subject matter should be kept to a minimum. As you can see here, like we clearly get a sense of the storefronts, the transoms, you know, all those all those details. You know, imagine how this photograph would look if all those parking spaces parking spaces out front were taken up by vehicles. We may not be able to see those details. And so avoid avoid things like shooting overhead power lines, telephone poles, or other distracting elements. Um, cars and trucks in the foreground should be removed. You know, some of the ways to get around those types of things, especially if you know you're going to be in a busy uh, commercial area, um, look to shoot in the early morning, late afternoon, or even sometimes on a Sunday morning if uh, when, when traffic is, is lighter. Um, same goes for pedestrian traffic. If there are many people in the foreground, simply wait until until they're gone. Um, sometimes it may be helpful, although I understand uh, you may you know you only do this if you have permission from the owner uh, to trim any shrubs or weeds uh, in front of the building before shooting. Um, overall, the fewer extraneous elements there are, um, the better. And so here's a few examples of of kind of. Um, I'll have a few examples here later on of, of kind of examples where that advice wasn't wasn't taken. Um, one thing to look keep in mind is backlighting. Um, this occurs when the main light source is behind the primary subject. Um, as you can see from these photographs here, the subject is silhouetted and the details in the foreground of the photograph are wiped out. Uh, to overcome backlighting, if you are using a manually adjusted camera, you can set your camera to meter for the dark foreground area and not the bright backlighted location. Um, if you're using an automatic camera, you can push, you can use uh, press the backlight button. And essentially, by compensating either manually or automatically for the overly bright area, the subject will be more or less properly lighted in the final print. Um, of course, you know we can't always pick and choose the times of day. When we're taking photographs of these properties, um, you know, you can try to avoid this too by keeping your back to the sun. Um, one thing to also keep in mind is try to prevent the sun from shining into your camera lens. So if you have a lens hood, um, or you can have a friend who literally can shield the sun, you know, shield the lens from the sun. Um, or reposition yourself slightly. So just kind of be aware of where the sun is when you're taking um, these photographs. And so like these were not these were photographs. These were part of a nomination update. Um, this is of the Okima Armory, and you, know, you can just you can just tell that these photographs were taken either really early in the morning or or late in the day. And you know again can't pick and choose always when we take these photographs. But you know these photographs could have been better. Same thing sunny or cloudy um, one key one key thing that i didn't i wasn't aware of before i had to start taking photographs was oftentimes um, overcast days are the best days to take um, photographs especially of um, exteriors because um, they help soften soften the light um, you know like a southern exposure for instance is is harsher and and brighter and so sometimes that kind of makes a difference in exposure times and how a photo is, is shot. Um, again, shooting in the early mornings and the late evenings also, you know, provides its um, its unique um, challenges in terms of basically because the color values change. And so in some cases, you know, the reds, you know, reds can become much redder uh, with, you know, when the amount of light is is decreased. So if you're having to shoot in early morning or late afternoon, um, a longer exposure may be needed to adequately light the subject. And so just kind of keep those keep those things in mind. Um, again, we can't always pick and choose when we're out taking photographs in the field, but especially for a National Register nomination, um, again, your goal is to put the property in its best light. And so you know if it is if if the if it's a really bright sunny day, the light's just really harsh. Um, maybe that's not the best day to take photographs, or maybe those are days you take photographs of the interior, something like that, um, and maybe wait for more ideal conditions to take exterior photographs. These are photographs taken from a recent survey report. Um, you know, try not to take photographs during a snowstorm. Um, again, 
we can't pick and choose always when we do these do these surveys or these do these photographs um, but it's really difficult to tell any you know anything that i need to see you know when we have gray skies we have snow everywhere we have cars parked because everybody's home so i have no sense of the streetscape here um, so you know keep those things keep those things in mind um, you know don't do this um, it's not uncommon uh, for us to wait until the winter to take national register nomination photographs um, you know because you know when winter comes those leaves would all be gone and so you can at least get a better sense of the building's facade without all those leaves present make sure your camera is level and as we mentioned earlier try to keep any extra elements out of the photograph um, be on the lookout for potential obstacles such as power poles vegetation sheds you know those types of things and just you know keep those things in mind and, and be be willing to to take those few extra steps to move to the right location to get the best possible photograph um, you know these photographs here are kind of a, a combination of all those different different habits you note uh, the photographs you know the photograph on the left is slightly crooked um, now again granted these are survey photographs these aren't necessarily a nomination photograph um, you know but be pay attention to how your photograph is framed be aware of um, certain obstacles such as power lines um, street lights traffic um, all those all those types of things um, the big takeaway from all this is you will sometimes have to take photographs in less than ideal conditions try to mitigate those the best that you can and again granted some of the photographs that i showed here previously are associated with architectural surveys or cultural resource surveys they're not necessarily associated with nominations but we have had occasions um, from our office and from national park service where we have returned nominations for revision if the photo quality is found to be unacceptable in terms of cameras here's another thing because pretty much you know we all have cell phones now for the most part um, per national park service regulations um, the the camera the in order to take the best photographs that you can uh, try to have at least a six megapixel digital slr slr camera that can take first generation tag image file format or tiff or raw images um, a raw file and that's basically raw um, is an uncompressed image meaning it contains the direct image taken from the camera with no loss of quality or alteration in contrast when you're taking a photograph and it's as a jpeg that file size gets compressed and so the raw image is the it's not compressed it is the literally the raw image so those you know raw images are generally large in size but the data is minimally processed with with no loss in in quality um, also acceptable are, are two to five megapixel point and shoot digital cameras. Um, you know, any disposable or single use digital cameras, those are not acceptable. Um, digital cameras with fewer than two megapixels are also not acceptable. Now that is, that was the, that's the official park service regulations. Now in 2018, the park service updated its requirements to allow cell phone cameras because their quality has increased dramatically. So for instance, um, my cell phone is capable of taking a photograph in both raw and JPEG format. I wouldn't want to, you know, I wouldn't want to shoot photographs of a historic district with my phone. I would still want to use um, a, um, you know, an SLR camera for something like that with, that's, you know, with a larger SD card. But, you know, oftentimes you know we're seeing more and more cell phone cameras um, are becoming better and better in quality and again like if, if you have the file size available you can you can take raw you know photographs in with in, in the raw image format on your cell phone in terms of the digital file format that we need um, in terms of submitting photographs for nominations to our office, we basically need the photographs in two digital formats. We need um, a format that's in that original RAW or TIFF format and a photograph in a version of it that's in a smaller 
more compressed JPEG um, format. We use the JPEGs because they're smaller files. We can use those for our PowerPoint presentations when we're, you know, presenting these nominations before local governments or before the committee. Um, the raw images we keep in our archives because we, we know we have the original uncompressed images of those photographs for whenever we may need them. The National Park Service um, no longer requires no longer requires a hard copy of photographs to be submitted with the nomination. Um, all of our submissions to National Park Service are completely digital. That was one thing that COVID kind of did the final push for in terms of that. All of our submissions are are digital. So when I submit nominations to the Park Service, I'm I'm you know submitting the nomination form and I am submitting um, the raw or TIFF. Um, image images you know images of the photographs um, however um, our office we prefer keeping a, a paper backup to all of our nominations we still have people come in uh, who walk into the office who are looking for um, a particular nomination or, or those types of things so they prefer to look at the those types of resources in print and so we our office still requires um, one copy of photographic prints um, at least four by six and preferably color. You know, we still have people who come in looking for hard copy photographs. And it's also, I think, a case of in, in comparing between, you know, storing things digitally compared to, you know, on paper in our folders, we have we have the space, fortunately, to be able to do both. And so we are able to maintain a paper archive as well as a digital archive. In terms of labeling, you know, labeling photographs, um, you know, there's an example on on the left, you know, how to how to basically name your digital photo files. Um, in the handouts, I provide an example. You know, I have um, our nomination submittal requirements in the handouts. I have a copy of our National Register manual in the handouts. This also provides um, that information. In terms of of storing digital photographs. Um, you know, we have um, archival, you know, gold archival CDs where we store, um, we store digital photographs. So any questions? If not, we're on the home stretch. So let's talk a little bit about the National Register form itself. The National Register form has gone through uh, several iterations since its since its since its inception. Um, the Park Service most recently revised the National Register form in 2012. So that's the that's the version of the form that our office currently uses. Um, that form is available at that following link. Um, I also have information on how to access it here later in the presentation as well. Um, the two major changes that happened between the 2012 for, form and the previous version was in Section 10 for geographic data. data it allowed for including latitude longitude coordinates and not just UTMs. And then also property owner information was deleted. So if you look at older nominations, if you access our database and you look at some of the older nominations, you'll see that there was a look, there was an entry for um, property owner information. Um, you know, that entry was removed in 2012 to protect personally identifiable information. We look by by section, um, and for some of you, this may be just a, a quick review. Um, you know, changes by section in sections one and two. Uh, you know, we did it moved uh, the multiple property uh, listing name to section one. So, if you are working on a nomination for a property that is eligible under a multiple property documentation, you include the name of that multiple property documentation um, in that line. Uh, the older forms also had codes for the state, the, the the county, and zip code. Those have since been removed, so you can just indicate, you know, the state code, you know, the state 
um, county and county and that type of thing. Section three, um, the form added a line for applicable criteria on page one. And this is the same information that is required on in section eight, it just included as well in, in section three. So in a sense, basically, if you open up um, a relatively you know recent nomination on that first page, it should indicate um, not only the uh, level of significance that the property is being nominated under, but also the applicable national register criteria, whether it's being listed under criterion A, criterion B, C, D, um, or any combination thereof. In section seven, in the older forms, there used to be um, multiple um, entries for exterior um, materials. Um, and that was because the Park Service at the time was creating a, a database where they could, you know, it could indicate like these are the many, these are the number of buildings that have stone foundations or, or um, you know, asphalt composition roofs, that type of thing. Um, that all went away with the 2012 form. Um, you are only expected to to enter the the principal exterior material. It can be you know one material. You know we still have folks who enter in. You know if there's two, if you think there's two principal exterior materials, you can enter both of those in. Um, but really, we just need we just need the one. It's not we're not expecting that that part to be as detailed. Um, and the 2012 form form also modified instructions for um, the summary paragraph. You know especially you know, the summary paragraph for section seven, it should describe the general characteristics of the property, such as its location, type, and style, um, its current um, physical appearance, and um, the number of contributing and not contributing resources, if applicable. Section eight, modify the summary paragraph instructions to include a period of significance and criteria considerations. And so essentially in that summary paragraph, you should include um, not just the level of significance and the applicable criteria, but that summary paragraph should also indicate, uh, you know, not just the period of significance, but why uh, you selected that period of significance and any applicable criteria considerations. So we talked about those yesterday. You know, if the building is a religious property, you need to indicate in the summary paragraph, the summary paragraph, why criteria consideration A applies. Or if the property is less than 50 years of age, you need to indicate why that criteria consideration applies in the summary paragraph. And then you would provide um, a more detailed explanation in the body of section eight below. Section 10, as I mentioned earlier, um, it now allows the option for, for use of either UTM or latitude longitude coordinates. Um, I will say the majority of, of nominations that, that I see now are using um, latitude longitude coordinates, um, you know, entering the data um, up, to six to, up, up to six decimal places. Um, I think it's just that's what people are most comfortable with and easily use. If you are, if you do prefer to use UTMs, you can still use those um, as well. The form provides for both. When it goes, you know, when I'm going through and applying um, my technical edits, you know, at the end before I submit this to our review committee or um, the National Park Service, you know, if the repair prefer to use latitude longitude, longitude coordinates, I will typically delete um, that portion of the form that includes um, the the, where you can enter in UTMs because they chose to use latitude longitude. So um, pick pick one or the other. Um, I will say most are using latitude and longitude. The photograph section, um, there were some changes to uh, instructions for the photographs. Um, and it did you know label the photo log area. Um, and so again, we kind of talked about the photo log um, earlier. The, the 2012 form update kind of helped, you know, helped update uh, you know, essentially updated that part of the nomination. And so, you know, whereas in earlier nominations, you don't see a photo log. And so sometimes when I'm reviewing those nominations, whether like I'm having to update it or I'm doing research, the photos are kind of a mess. Um, this was a great thing about the, the 2012 update is it helped organize um, the photographs so I can have a good sense of, of what I'm looking at um, when I'm, you know, researching nominations. In terms of, of owner information, um, in accordance with the OMB's initiative to minimize personally identifiable information, um, that information was scrapped 
uh, in the uh, 2012 nomination. What we use instead um, are, you know, each state is slightly different. What we have is what we call exhibits A and B. Um, exhibit A is the property owner information. Exhibit B is the local elected officials information. And those forms are also available, um, you know, they're PDFs that are available at our office through through the link below. And so essentially, you know, while the property owner owner information doesn't appear on the nomination form itself, we still keep that owner information on file. That way we know who to contact when nomination is being processed, you know, when the property's been listed and and so forth. And we do we do keep that information in the file. Now, one thing we, we do not do is we do not keep track of the you know property ownership of listed properties so if the property then changes hands um, we more often than not will not know about that but we at least keep track of who owned the property when the nomination was listed or when the property was listed so to recap submit your nomination on the form saved in microsoft word format um, our office will convert the Word version to PDF for formal submission to the Park Service when all steps in the nomination process have been completed and any necessary revisions have been made. So the form, you know, mentioned earlier, where everything's moved digitally. And so the form itself is a, it's an editable Microsoft Word document. Um, you know, I still have, you know, it's, it's rare, but I still have folks who, you know, they're interested in doing, you know, they're, you know, they're writing a, a their handwriting the nomination or they're, you know, they're preparing it on a separate document. Um, I'm happy to work with um, nomination preparers to the extent that I can. Um, and especially if it is, you know, someone who, you know, if you own this property and you're looking to get it listed and you may not have as much expertise in working with the form, you know, please let me know and I can try to, you know, handle some of the more technical aspects um, for you. Um, a couple other things to keep in mind. Um, although the National Park Service now allows digital images to be embedded within the text of a nomination, our office does not allow that practice. So include any historic photographs or any figures, anything like that. You just can simply include those you know, at the end of the nomination form. Um, so yeah, any questions? Have a couple more sections to get through, and then we will be we will be wrapped up. So, a fairly unique circumstance here in terms of redacting information, but it does come in uh, from time to time for um, either archaeological properties, um, traditional cultural places, um, anything where we have um, you know if there's a, a risk of um, you know. Of, of a you know anything that it could represent an invasion of privacy or harm to the resource um you know those types of things we can we can limit what information becomes um, available for for publication and so um, to do that under section two and location there's a box that says not for publication um you know if if there's a risk, if there's sensitive material that is included in the nomination, say it's an archaeological site, and you know we don't want that location information being uh, being made available publicly, we can check that box for to indicate that's not for publication. Um, that pertains to Section 304 of the National Historic Preservation Act, which states that the Secretary of the Interior can withhold information about the character, location, or ownership of a property if disclosure may, one, cause an invasion of privacy, two, risk harm to the resource, or three, impede the use of a traditional religious site by practitioners. So how is that section 304 used? It is generally used for archeological properties. Um, it's to protect those types of properties from, from looting. Um, it can also be used in conjunction with, um, with ARPA the Archaeological Resources Protection Act of 1979, which governs the excavation of archaeological sites on federal and Indian lands in the United States and the removal and disposition of archaeological collections from those sites. 
So what type of information should be withheld? Um, this is often locational information. Think maps, photographs, and text. Um, if you are preparing a nomination that includes you know sensitive information that's related to a site or a traditional cultural site um, clearly mark anything that should be withheld at the beginning of the nomination process that way we can release only what um, what can be released there's a couple of examples of, of doing this um, one is the old-fashioned way where um, you know we literally you know with a you know, permanent marker, you know, can can mark up the nomination and, and include and, and blot out those sections that include any sensitive information, um, especially for older nominations. Uh, the benefit of using Microsoft Word is, you know, we can include, um, you know, you can include headers stating um, um, when, you know, when you're, you know, what, you know, you basically outline a section that includes all of the sensitive information such as the location information and in that type of thing and so that gives us a clear indicator of what sections need to be cut out from the version of the nomination that may be from the from a version of the nomination that we may make available to the public if we have to um, another option uh, is simply submitting two versions of the nomination one um, that includes the full nomination and one that redacts all sensitive information. And bottom line, just make sure that um, what needs to be redacted is clear. And again, that's a pretty rare circumstance, um, but it does happen. I did see one question come up about the, from JD Merriweather about uh, basically once submitted, so essentially, once a nomination is submitted, how long does the approval process take? And so this was a question. This came up uh, also yesterday during um, our discussion about the National Register process itself. And so essentially, um, all of our nominations are reviewed um, quarterly by a review committee. So it's the State Historic Preservation Review Committee. They meet in January, April, July, and October of each year. Um, typically, before those not before those committee meetings, I have to have any nominations that are going to be considered at that meeting finalized 60 days, 60 days at least 60 days prior to the date of that meeting. And so, um, you know, so if you know for if the committee is meeting in January, the nominations that they will be considering, I need to have those finalized, you know, by early November, essentially. Once those nominations are reviewed by the review committee, um, you know, I then take it may take a couple of weeks, depending on the number of nominations, for me to uh, make any final necessary edits that the committee asks, um, and then they get submitted on to the National Park Service. Uh, the National Park Service has 45 business days to either approve the nomination, reject it, or return it for revision. Um, Generally speaking, and, and JD, this is a, a good question, just talk about the overall kind of the length of the process. Um, you know, I had the McLean home pictured earlier. So that's a, it was a nomination for, for one building. Um, you know, that nomination took about nine months from start date of me doing the research and all of that to when the nomination was approved by the National Park Service. That's because there's there are some times in there where it's subject to review by our review committee and other things, and so it, it, it can take can take a while. So this is not an overnight process, and so I hope that answers your question. A few more things, just a few kind of things that have come up um, over you know over the years in terms of, of nominations that our offices sees and. Um, one thing to keep in mind is uh, privacy. Um, all photographs received by the National Park Service are posted unless, you know, we indicate otherwise in terms of, of sensitive information. So if an owner does not want to photograph online, please evaluate whether it should be submitted. So like here's a photograph of, yes, we see the lovely garage, but we also see some lovely valuable cars inside said garage. So maybe, you know, close those garage doors. Um, you know, just, just be aware um, of, um, you know, 
you know, once those photographs are submitted to the National Park Service, you know, the Park, the Park Service will post them. They can use them um, for presentations or other things like that. So just keep that in mind. Same thing for photographs, um, you know, of the interior. Simply just use use discretion. Um, you know, you know, if if you do need to take interior photographs, um, you know, again, you may need to take um, a number of photographs so you get a good sense of the key spaces, features, and finishes. But in terms of then submitting said photographs to the nomination, maybe include only one or two, and maybe include you know ones that don't include um, you know a bunch of potentially valuable images, you know valuable items that could that could be stolen. Um, not all photographs need to be submitted. Remember that what has been seen cannot be unseen. And then lastly, in terms of mapping, um, our office and the National Park Service accepts web-generated maps at the end of the nomination form or in a separate Microsoft Word document. So even the mapping process has become much easier thanks to um, the you know since thanks to things like Google Earth or ArcGIS. Um, when submitting a web-generated map, the following is required: um, figure the latitude and longitude coordinates in decimal degrees up to at least six decimal places. Um, you also should list the, the datum information with the map attachment. Digital format will be WGS datum 1984. USGS paper maps will be NAD 1927 or NAD 1983. Um, when you're using uh, digital lati latitude uh, longitude coordinates, um, don't forget to include the negative symbol for uh, longitude. Um, or your map will appear in the wrong hemisphere. And here's just a couple examples of some map attachments. Typically, you need to include, um, you know, two maps. Um, one would be like what we saw on the previous slide, a good kind of large scale map that kind of puts the entire property in context. And then a second map that includes a, a close up larger scale um, map that depicts the nomination um, boundaries again uh, in this case so the the property location is indicated by that kind of light orange thumbtack we have the latitude longitude coordinates um, you know above it we have you know the, the nominations for this individual building so we see the building clearly outlined um, we have a scale we have a, an arrow the red arrow you know and giving us the the you know giving us where north is essentially um, you know, these and these types of maps can easily be obtained through um, ArcGIS or or Google Earth. Um, so especially Google Earth, I think that's a map that that's a you know platform that I see a lot of folks use. It's readily accessible. Um, it's pretty intuitive to use. Um, one thing to keep in mind about Google Earth is it is a separate application. It's not quite the same as Google Maps that you see like on your web browser. And so just, you know, be aware of that, you, but it is available to install for free. Um, ArcGIS is a similar, um, uh, is a Arc, basically ArcGIS Explorer is their um, free GIS application. Um, works somewhat similarly as Google Earth. Um, um, it does provide some things differently uh, in terms of collecting coordinates. It can produce paper maps, um, you know, provide, it does have a, does offer a few more options compared to to Google to Google Earth, but regardless of what platform you use, you know we just need a basic map that includes the location of the building, coordinates, a scale, um, you know the north arrow, you know things like that. And if you are if this is your first time preparing something like this, um, I'm more than happy to to help you with with that aspect of the process. So here's just a kind of a couple of examples of of how you know the the map can look on um, a nomination form. Um, for properties that are less than 10 acres, we only need a single latitude longitude coordinate. Um, if it's a property that's more than 10 acres, so like if you're working on a district nomination, uh, provide latitude longitude points at the corners of the polygon that represents uh, the boundaries. Another thing to, to think about is that uh, the map should be easy, easily reproducible in black and white. So if I need to make a quick paper copy of, of a map, you know, keep that in mind.
that it should be um, reproducible in black and white. That's it. Um, in terms of where you can find um, all this information, you know, so here's a screenshot of our website, um, www.okhistory.org backslash SHPO. You can find more specific information on the National Register if you click on the Programs tab. Um, you click on that. Um, there you see, you'll, you'll see our various programs. National Register is first on the list. If you click on that tab, it provides you um, a wealth of information about the application process, um, including what I have highlighted here are um, nomination and submittal requirements. And so um, just, and I also have those attached to the presentation handouts as well. And so that provides links to the various different policies, to the different forms, um, all those types of all those types of things. And so if you have any questions about um, accessing those those forms or any questions about the requirements, you're more than welcome to to reach out to me. And so with that, you know, I'm happy to take um, any last few questions. It looks like I have a couple of questions coming up in the Q&A tab. Um, you know, all of our forms can be accessed. Um, you know, if you click on, if you're on our website, you click on the consultants tab, you'll see a, a link for forms. And then you'll see, you know, where you can download the, the National Register form as um, a Microsoft Word document. If you need to include things like the map and any historic photographs, you can download the continuation form and just paste those onto that. Um, again, it's a pretty, um, it, it's, it's, it can be daunting, um, but once you get started with it, or especially once you've done it once, um, it's kind of like, it's like riding a bike and, and it becomes pretty straightforward. Well, I thought I had a quite question, but maybe not. Well, that's all that I have. Um, thank you all for attending today. Um, Again, we'll get certificates out to those of you who need them um, once this webinar is wrapped up. Um, so this was, presentation was going to last about an hour and 30 minutes, and I'm at an hour and 31 minutes. So I will I will call that good. If there are no questions, um, feel free to feel free to go. And um, uh, thanks again for attending.